All right, so Don, like we all know, needs no introduction. He's already given us a little bit of what he's going to be teaching us this evening. But I'll also tell you all a little bit about that. So Don Peppers this evening is going to teach us how to automate the customer experience to make it frictionless while humanizing our relationship with the customer to improve trust, engagement, and loyalty. Develop an emotionally compelling sense of purpose within our organization so we can deal with disruption and enable innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Don Peppers this evening. Thank you very much. Very nice. Uh, wow. Good to see the class here. Um, now, this is a class, and uh, you're sitting at tables for a reason. Learn the people at your table, because I'm going to ask you in about 30, 40 minutes, I'm going to ask each table to engage in an exercise. All right? So there'll be some interaction, and then I want, uh, I want to see what kind of results we come up with uh, among everybody. All right? There we go. All right. I talked this morning. How many of you heard the keynote this morning? About two-thirds. All right. Well, this morning I talked about the importance of humanity um, and how face-to-face -face communication is never going to go out of style, and it's probably not in our lifetimes will it be imitated by robots or chatbots, which will always be more in the routine kind of interactions you would have with a, a company. Um, I think it's important not to get the wrong message from what I said. I think it's very important to automate as much of the customer experience as you can, because by automating it, you make it frictionless. However, you can't automate the whole thing. And what we're going to talk about today is how to get the most out of automation while still concentrating on making those human connections with customers. OK? And where I'm going to start is with Bobby Fisher in 1972. Anybody know who Bobby Fisher is? Right? World chess champion in 1972. He was the, he beat Boris Spassky. Then um, uh, he was a child prodigy. He was a grandmaster at age 13 in New York, in the New York Chess Club. He was my idol when I was growing up. I thought it was great. Um, he was a first really accomplished, brilliant American grandmaster. Most, most world chess champions in the 20th century have been Russians, including Garry Kasparov, who became world champion in 1985. He was the longest reigning world champion in the 20th century. Um, he was dethroned in 1997 by IBM. IBM's Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov in a seven game match, four games to three. In fact, in the last game, the computer beat Kasparov in 18 moves, which is unheard of at that level of play. But we're now 21 years later. Who do you think the world champion of chess is today? But technically, the world champion is still, you know, a human being, okay? Because the world, the, the FIDA, the World Chess Championship only goes to a human. But the best chess player in the world today is operated by this man. Anybody know who this is? This is Anson Williams. He's the captain of the Ibermax human computer team. Today, it's called advanced chess. Kasparov sanctions it himself. He loves advanced chess. Advanced chess is when you're a human player armed with whatever computer support you want and you're playing against other people who are also armed with their computer support. So it's computer, human team. It's called advanced chess. It's also known as centaur chess. Okay? We probably are in a limited time period, maybe 20 more years, maybe two more years, during which human computer teams will beat computers by themselves or humans by themselves. Because in the not too distant future, chess is a very exact game. It's very calculatable. In the not too distant future, a, a fully computerized game will again become the very best, e even better than human beings armed with computers. Um, 
But for now, the reason I put this up as an analogy is I think marketing is evolving to something you could call centaur marketing, okay? It's human initiative, judgment, wisdom, creativity, augmented by computer technology. And whether you're running a chatbot uh, uh, AI program uh, or platform, like, uh, like uh, one of our sponsors is, or your, um, uh, your Microsoft running Cortana, or Amazon running Alexis, Alexa, uh, it's basically going to be up to humans to code the right responses into these computers. I want to, I want to start today's class by going back to a graph I used this morning. Remember I said there are two dimensions of competition. How many customers do you have and how many needs do you address? You can be product-centric, focusing on one need at a time and trying to sell that to as many customers as possible. Or you can be customer-centric, focused on one customer at a time and trying to address as many of that customer's needs as possible. And uh, I said the objectives of a product-centric marketer are to maximize the, product, the profitability of a product, okay? And the objectives of customer-centric marketing is to maximize the value of an individual customer. But what should you do if you're trying to, what, what is it, what task are you accomplishing if you, ma and what task do you have to accomplish to maximize the value of a customer? You manage the public's perception if you're product centric. If you're customer centric, you try, try to manage each customer's experience. <clears throat> the customer experience is how the customer experiences their interactions with you. That's what you're trying to manage, okay? That means you have to be empathetic with the customer and understand what it's like to be that customer. You have to realize that different customers will experience you differently. They have different um, prejudices, different preconceived notions, different emotional makeup, different needs. But what is customer experience? It's one of the most used words in marketing and sales and customer service today. We all talk about customer experience. What is it? Well, my consultants at Peppers and Roger Group and I spent a couple of days in a workshop, cooped up, trying to come to grips with a real, comprehensive, useful definition of customer experience. And here's what we came up with. Customer experience is the totality of a customer's individual interactions with the brand over time. Now let me take you through this, okay? Customer. By customer, we're not just talking about customer, we're also talking about prospective customer. Because a prospect has a customer experience also when they're going through the sales funnel, right? Uh, <clears throat> individual interactions occur both face-to-face -face and via interactive media. But they're individual interactions. They don't happen on mass media. They happen one-to-one -one media. With a brand. A customer's interactions about your brand, when they post comments on Yelp or Facebook about you, that's not part of the customer experience. They're talking about maybe their customer experience, but you're not involved in that. That's not part of their customer experience with you. That, that has to be an interaction with you. But brand means all the selling entities. So if you're a car manufacturer, part of your customer's experience, the end consumer, is their experience with your dealer network and your insurance provider, okay, and your financing arm, all right? If you're a stockbroker, part of the customer's experience is with the individual financial advisors, some of them independent that you deal with. All of the, the brand includes everything associated with that product or service that's being sold. And finally, over time recognizes, I think we use those words to recognize explicitly that customer relationships are ongoing. They keep going. They don't stop. All right? Now, <clears throat> some of you might be disappointed in this uh, definition of experience because a lot of people think customer experience means creating delight or an exceeding, uh, that a customer experience is what you have at Disney. Okay? 
or the Taj Hotel. It's a fantastic hotel. And by the way, this is the best hotel I think I've ever been in in my life, and I've been at many, many hotels in 65 countries around the world. Taj, hey, I'm going to congratulate Mumbai. The Taj is like the best hotel I've ever been at. It's great. Um, and it's an experience. I could stay at the Taj for the benefit of the experience itself. But that's, that's experience with a capital E. I'm not talking about that kind of experience. When we talk about customer experience with a small e, every customer of every company has an experience. Okay? It's just not the experience, capital E, that they're looking for when they go to Taj Hotel or Disney uh, or maybe a fine restaurant or something like that. Okay? So we're talking about small e customer experience, uniform for everybody. And the thing is, like water or electricity, customers always seek the path of least resistance. By the way, <coughs> you guys got this this morning at Tarotany's. Oh, did, did, you get, did the conference attendees get this, or did they have to buy it? It's, it's, it's provided. It's a great report. It is a great report. Um, Taragni uh, did a, um, they did an, um, um, a, like an effort assessment uh, score, ease, E-A-S, get it? Ease, how easy is it? Um, for several different uh, categories in the Indian economy. Uh, and, and it's a really, really good perspective on what's important about a customer experience. Because for the customer, you know, he just wants to get his need met or his problem solved. He's not buying from you, probably he's not buying from you, to have an experience. He's buying from you because he thinks you can solve his problem or that you can meet his need. But if the need went away, that would be a really great experience. No matter how well you design your service or product, the user, the customer, is going to find their own way. You can have a delightfully um, uh, aesthetic design for this crosswalk, but you can see the user experience, they just avoid that altogether. It's so stupid. And uh, you can design for where you think customers are going to go, but that isn't necessarily where they're really going. So the customer just wants his need met with as little effort as possible. He wants to encounter as little friction as possible. Friction and effort, you can almost talk about them some, uh, synonymously. Friction is caused when I have to exert effort to do something uh, or to have something. Friction is what causes attrition. Believe it or not, research shows conclusively that customer loyalty is not highly correlated with customer satisfaction. It's customer disloyalty that is highly correlated with customer dissatisfaction. Satisfying a customer does not mean that you're going to make him loyal. It means he's not going to go today. When you have a bad experience, that's always an opportunity for the customer to leave. That's when the customer leaves. I'll tell you a story. <clears throat> friend of mine is a management consultant, and he, uh, he specializes in handling retailers uh, and companies that sell in to retailers. That's his discipline. He said that he was out shopping for a new pair of running shoes one Saturday afternoon in the U.S. during Christmas season, very heavy shopping season. And the mall was jammed, and he went into an athletic shoe store to try to find his shoes, and the store was mobbed. There were several people waiting for each salesperson. So he got in line for his salesperson and was waiting. And he said the first person in line uh, to be served by this salesperson was a young woman who was looking for some cross trainers and kind of had her eye on Reebok cross trainers. And the salesman made her a pitch for a different brand. The salesman said, yes, ma'am, we can put those Reeboks on you, but you know, New American is a brand you never heard of, probably, but they're about half the price of Reebok, and they make a really great cross trainer. You want to bring them out? A lot of my clients like Reebok, uh, like uh, New American. And uh, she said, okay, she wants to try them. So she did. She brought them out. Uh, the salesman brought them out. 
and she bought the Reebok, uh, bought the uh, new American brand, this off brand, at half the price of the Reeboks. Next guy up was looking at some basketball shoes that Nike made. And a salesman made him the same pitch. Nike makes a great basketball shoe, but so does this new brand, New American, and they're about half the price of the Nike. Why don't I bring them out and you can try them on? And so he brought them out. He bought the New American also, right? So now my friend is perplexed. He's puzzled. He's deeply interested in the fact that this salesperson has sold two people on an off-brand that he didn't even know existed, okay? And they had taken less than half the money from each customer that the customer was willing to spend by selling that brand. So what was New American's secret? That was what he wanted to know. So it was his term. That's what he asked. I couldn't help but see that you just sold two people on this brand. What, what's their secret? What are they doing? How are they getting you to... Oh, uh, uh, it's, it's nothing, the salesman said. Well, wait, wait, wait. It's, it's a commission, right? It's a commission? You get a commission on the... No, no, it's a contest. No, he kept guessing, and finally the guy said, look, 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 look. See how busy the store is? Don't tell my manager, all right? But see how busy the store is? I don't have time to go to the bathroom on a Saturday afternoon during Christmas season. It's so busy in here. New American, when they ship their shoes to the store, their laces are already in the shoes. New American was taking the friction out of the salesman's customer experience. The salesman was the customer for New American. The consumers were the customer of the salesman. What New American did was they took the friction out by, by putting laces in the shoes before the shoes were shipped to the store. So if you're a retail bank, then you should lace up your customer's shoes by maybe filling out all the information on the loan form the customer is filling out that you already know. You know the customer's name and address, account numbers and balances. Why do you ask the customer to put that information on the loan application? Right? That's a lot of effort that the customer shouldn't have to expend because you already have that information. If you're an airline, lace up your customer's shoes by automatically creating, um, uh, uh, accrediting passengers with a refund when it's due and by rebooking them on a canceled flight without requiring them to call. Okay? If you're a mobile, oh, whoop, whoop. If you're a mobile phone company, you should be printing out a sample bill while the customer is in your store when they've just signed up. You know why? Because that's the single most obstructive, friction-filled process that a new customer of a mobile company has, figuring out why the bill this month is more than it was supposed to be. Okay? They almost always call in. You know, why is that? Why don't you just explain it to them when they're buying the phone? They're signing up for the service. On the whole, my argument is the very best customer experience is no experience. If the customer's problem would just go away magically, just disappear, that would be the best experience. He never would have to even deal with anybody. Not that he doesn't like you, but dealing with anybody is effort. I don't want to have to exert that effort. So my colleagues and I thought long and hard about <clears throat> about what is the quality? What are the qualities of a truly frictionless customer experience? If a, friction, if a customer experience really doesn't require any effort on the customer's part at all, then how would you describe that customer experience? Well, first, it's reliable. The product works. The service works. They answer the phone. The bills are correct. Okay, the product is reliable. But second, it's valuable, okay? Um, and, and, and valuable means that not necessarily the lowest price, but it's on a par with its competitive set. Third, it's relevant. It's, uh, the customer doesn't have to tell you again what he already told you. Okay? You don't try to sell him something you already sold him. You don't try to sell a young woman on a male product. You don't try to sell an older person on a young person's product. You don't try to sell something that's inappropriate for people. And it's trustable. The word trustable and trustability it's an important word. I'm going to come back to it uh, frequently during the discussion. But first, let's talk about reliability. I think what you need to do, you know what? I've got to hang on a minute. Take this off. Why did I have that on there? Sorry. You need to minimize one problem at a time. I'll tell you what Fidelity does. Fidelity's chief customer officer has a budget 
uh, of a couple million dollars to eliminate friction. And he can tap that budget without getting board approval on his own initiative. His people come to him and they have a project and they do it. So at the contact center, one of the agents noticed that people were, they seemed to be having a problem logging in online to their accounts. He talked to another contact center agent. They, had, they ex experienced the same problem. So they went to, the, um, uh, went to the software guys. They figured out it was a vendor uh, just off premises. Then they went to the vice president, uh, the uh, chief marketing, chief customer officer, and got $20,000, and they fixed the problem. And now they've, they've saved Fidelity about $4 million a year in um, uh, calls simply by fixing a simple problem being able to identify one problem at a time. And uh, the value proposition needs to be obvious to both parties. What's a value proposition? The customer gets value, and the business gets value. So a valuable experience is one where the customer recognizes that they're getting value, and the company also is getting value. Sometimes a company can get value by reducing its costs in the same way. When you eliminate friction in the process, not only does it save the customer effort, it often saves the company cost. I want to tell you a story. <clears throat> in 1906, the British physicist, J.J. Thompson, he won the Nobel Prize because he proved that the electron was a particle. More than 30 years later, in 1937, J.J. Thompson's son, George, won a Nobel Prize for proving that the electron is actually a wave. Now, who was right? They were both right. If anybody knows anything about quantum mechanics, it's called wave-particle duality. Whether a, a subatomic particle is a wave or a particle depends on how you see it and who, who observes it and when. Don't ask why that happens. No one can understand it. Right? No one understands it. If you think you understand it, it's clear that you don't. Right? Quantum mechanics is, 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 is voodoo-like. Um, but I think in the marketing and customer service field, there's something that we should call customer experience duality. And I want to tell you a story. About 15 years ago, I did an engagement with St. George Bank in Australia. And at the time, St. George Bank had an innovative ATM. The way it worked was, when you put your cash card into the St. George Bank ATM and you entered your PIN code, the first message was, welcome back, Mr. Peppers. Would you like your usual $200 cash, no receipt, yes or no? That's very convenient for a customer. Maybe that's a little more common today at ATMs. You know, you usually have your usual, right? But in 2002 or 2003, when I met with St. George Bank the first time, it was a highly unusual program. I was a Citibank customer in New York City, and I would go into my cash machine, the same cash machine I used, the same machine that I used every week, and I put my PIN code in, and the first question was, what language do you want to speak? English, Spanish, and... So I thought this was a fantastic way to improve the customer experience, taking effort out of the customer experience, taking friction out of the process. And in the afternoon, I met with the CIO of St. George Bank. And I congratulated him. I said, wow, the marketing people are really getting a lot of benefit out of this program. It's a great boost to customer uh, service and customer satisfaction. Congratulations on being able to do this. And the CIO, who was kind of a gruff guy, he said, uh, that's not why we did it. <laughs> is, that what, oh, is that what the marketing people told you? It has nothing to do with it. What do you mean, I said? He said, look, here's why we did that. Real estate for ATM machines in Sydney, Australia, it's expensive. It's difficult to put one in. This way, when we put an ATM in a place, it serves more people in the same amount of time. Now, who was right? They were both right. When you take friction out of the process, whether it's making products to order so that you don't have to have a lot of products in inventory, or whether it's better asset utilization, as in the ATMs, you save money for yourself and you create value for the customer. Amazon, they have one 
customer experience metric that they measure with their contact center, the negative resolution rate, NRR. Every person who calls in to the Amazon helpline, every person who, is, they know that anytime somebody calls in, it means they weren't able to get it done online. Right? 90% <clears throat> of the time, uh, when you call in to a contact center, it's because you weren't able to get satisfied online. You couldn't do it online. That's 90% of the reason why people call. So Amazon wanted to know for every caller whether the call resolved the, the problem. Did it resolve? So after every, uh, er, they know your email address because they know who you are. They know how to reach you. So after every call, they send an email out. Was your problem resolved? Yes or no? If you didn't get an answer, they would send it out again. They got about a 60, 70% compliance rate on this. And they're looking for a negative resolution, resolution rate in the very you know, um, low teens, maybe, maybe even below 10%. They're looking at 92, 93% resolution, successful resolution. And that's uh, phenomenal for most companies. But what they're doing is, each time they get a non-resolved problem, they figure out why it wasn't resolved, and they try to make sure that that problem never happens again. They take one more little tiny piece of friction out of the customer experience for everybody. OK. <clears throat> Relevance. I, I talked about um, reliability and value. Reliability and value you could think of as product competence. Are you competent to handle the product and deliver the service on time and as ordered and no mistakes, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, relevance and trustability have to do with customer competence. Are you competent to deal with different customers differently? Are you competent to respect the customer's interest? Okay. You know, let me give you an example of relevance. Different customers could have different needs of any product. In fact, what Lego found in their research was that three 10-year-old boys might walk into a toy store and buy the same Lego Star Wars set for three totally different reasons. One little boy is a role player. He wants to put that Star Wars set together, so he's going to now dress up as Darth Vader or Luke Skywalker, right? And, and act out. He's playing a role. Another little boy, his fun is putting the diagram together exactly the way the pieces go. And once he's got it together, wow, he's had a great deal of fun. He might leave it together for a week or two. Then he tears it apart again and does it again. He's a constructor. Still another little boy, about 4%, 5% of their customer base, Lego told me, consisted of creators. A creator is somebody who wouldn't dream of putting together something that somebody else had already put in a diagram. They want to build something new. Now, Lego says, just think about all the different things that we could sell to these kids if we just knew which was which. If we know you're a creator, we could sell you contests and storybooks. If we know that you're a, a role player, we could sell you hats and costumes and lightsabers. Okay? If we know that you're a constructor, we can sell you more diagrams for the same set. We could give you inventory control software for your, your PC, uh, all the Legos that you have, all the different sets, and different diagrams. Think, think of all you could do. But here's the question. How do they find out which boy is which? They paid the same price. They bought it on the same day. They might have live in the same neighborhood. These differences are purely psychological. They're predilections. They're not going to be found in any big data source anywhere. So the way to find out these different psychologies is by having an interaction with their customer. They engage in some kind of interaction that reveals the little boy's hidden motivations, his real, uh, as uh, his real aspiration. They engage in what I call golden questions. A golden question is an interaction that reveals a great deal about a, an individual customer without subjecting that customer to a, a big 35-page questionnaire or a 100-question survey, okay? It doesn't require in-depth interviews. 
some single idea. Let me give you an example. <coughs> Excuse me. One of our clients was a vacation timesharing company. They sold uh, uh, timeshares. So people bought these timeshares for a couple different reasons. Some people bought the timeshare because every summer they would come down and vacation in this place that they partially own. They want to take two weeks every summer, and that was their two weeks, and buying a timeshare was easier than paying, up front, uh, paying uh, on an a la carte basis. But some people use that timeshare, they trade it around with other timeshares, they go different places. What the research showed, however, was that the single biggest predictor of the kind of vacationer you were was the age of your children. If you have children under the age of about 12 or 13, you are 90% likely to go to one place every summer. It's only when you have older children and no children that you experiment and go different places. So the salespeople, when they're engaged with a prospect, one of the questions is, oh, and by the way, how old are your children? And now they change their sales pitch, one way or the other. Or think about <clears throat> something we did for an automotive manufacturer in the United States. They wanted to have a, uh, an owner management loyalty program, basically. They wanted to recruit owners of their label to a loyalty program. So they, and, and by the way, they didn't know who all these owners were. They knew who bought, bought the car, car knew. They had records of that. But if you bought a used brand of this car, they couldn't find out your identity. So they were going to invite you to participate in the you know, uh, loyalty program. And they had a kind of a sporty car, so they thought, well, what we'll do is we'll give you a pair of racing gloves, free. It's a gift. It's worth $10, $12. Sign up for our loyalty management program. We'll give you this, these racing gloves with our logo. Here's the problem. A large minority of their segment were mothers with small children. And they're not going to be interested at all in racing gloves, no matter how cool they look. So instead, the car company launched the owner loyalty program like this. Join our oil loyalty program for this brand, and we'll give you your choice. You can have a pair of racing gloves and a logo. You can have a package of children's videotapes, or you can have a road atlas and travel umbrella. The gift that you choose tells us who you are and how to call, talk with you in the future, what your needs are. It tells us it is, that is how we tailor your customer experience. You've helped tell us what customer experience is right for you, is relevant to you. This is all about relevance, right? Making the customer experience relevant. One more. Try this. Up, 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 wait a minute. There. A website selling pet food and supplies had a single yes or no question that uh, reliably identified the most valuable pet owners. And the question was not, do you love your pet or how much does your dog weigh? Okay? Anybody know what that question was? Last year, did you give your pet a holiday present? Some people gift their pets and some people do not. But guess who are the most valuable pet owners? Right. That's a golden question. We have to think about those interactions in order to, to, derive, in order to derive insight from our customers. Fourth quality. Trustability. <clears throat> I said this is going to be um, uh, a pretty. Trustability is a pretty big um, idea. And uh, trust <clears throat> has always been important. It's been important to have the customer's trust, if possible, from the beginning of commerce, really. And if you look at trust, um, and the academic research on trust, it involves two primary qualities, okay? If I trust a company to work with, then I probably believe that the company has good intentions. What do I mean by that? I mean, they don't tell me stuff just to get me to buy. They tell me stuff because they think it's in my interest, or they think my life will be improved, or they're going to solve my problem fast, or whatever. 
They don't just tell me whatever that takes to get me to buy. That wouldn't be good intentions. But also, they have to have a level of competence, OK? Competence. So good intentions and competence. See, they're throwing this kid up in the air. She trusts them to catch her if two things are true, that they're capable of catching her, competence, they're competent to catch her, and that they want to catch her, OK? They both have to be true. That's what trustability involves. But it goes even further, and I'll get to it in a little while. But let's just talk about the issues here. Moore's law has a corollary. Moore's law, every 20 years, computers get 1,000 times more powerful. The corollary is known as Zuckerberg's law. Zuckerberg's law is every 20 years, we interact 1,000 times more with others. You think about the way that you interact with Facebook and uh, LinkedIn. Um, uh, you know, it's today, today, there's no question that people, the average American child above 12 years old sends 400 or more text messages a day. By text message, I'm talking about Instagram and SMS uh, and Pinterest. Uh, and uh, uh, um, WhatsApp uh, and other kinds of apps. You know, think of your life 20 years ago in 2008. Uh, to, uh, no, 1998, before you had Facebook or LinkedIn or anything, before you had smartphones and apps, uh, before a lot of people had hard, uh, a lot of people didn't even have broadband uh, or didn't, uh, some didn't have access to internets at all. And today, you enter up to 1,000 times more with others. 20 years from today, 2038, your children or grandchildren will interact 1,000 times more with their friends and relatives as you do today. These interactions may be more and more automated. You may have proxies doing it. I might have my own couple of bots that, that handle family and friends and colleagues, whatever. Uh, but it's clear that interaction happens a lot more. And the more we interact, the more trust we demand. We want to be able to trust the party on the other end of the interaction. Why? Because trust makes interactions efficient. I don't have time to try to deal with the facts. I have to be able to trust the people I'm relying on. I have to be able to trust the companies I'm dealing with. I don't want to count my change every time I buy groceries. right? And I don't want to have to check my hard drive for uh, spamware uh, every time I interact with a website. So trust makes interactions efficient, and interactions generate transparency in the world. The world is way more transparent today than it ever has been, from WikiLeaks to, to the Panama Papers. Uh, there's not a day goes by that you don't read about some other scandal that's uncovered because of interactions or emails or uh, um, uh, social media, whatever, they're revealed. So if you are acting in an untrustable way, you will be outed. People will find out. You might, in fact, make a lot of money off some customer by fooling them out of their money, but you won't make much money later once it gets out that that's what you did. Okay? And when it goes online, you can't get it off. Once your bad reputation is online, you cannot get it off. Some pundit said, dude, you can't take something bad off the internet. That's like trying to take pee out of a swimming pool. Once the pee goes in the pool, it's in the pool. You're not going to get it out. You can add water, but you can't extract the pee. Okay? The internet is the same way. So how much pee is there in your reputation on the internet? It's there to stay. The only thing you can do at this point is add water, add goodwill, improve your reputation going forward. The problem, as Marshall McLuhan had said, um, is marketers will eventually ruin every party they're invited to. Marketers are too short-sighted. Marketers are always thinking about sales today. What's in it for me today? What have you bought from me today? To a marketer, a new customer is worth more than an existing valuable customer. I mean, it's a, it's a phenomenal problem that we've got.
gotten ourselves into because of the product-centric century, the 20th century. <coughs> Let me show you some things that are not trustable, <clears throat> that marketers do all the time. They're, ex they're, they're regular practices at many companies. Hiding price increases or service charges or fees, okay? Not making them obvious because you don't want to scare off people. Failing to notify customers of upcoming chain charges. Okay, you got a late fee coming up, but you don't tell somebody because you don't want you want to get that late fee. Or benefiting from a customer's lack of knowledge. That's a common marketing and sales strategy. You know more than the customer? Don't tell them. You know, you've got a secret. Intentionally adding friction to the refund process. When you know, yeah, you do a refund, or you can disconnect, but you can't do it online. You gotta, you gotta call in, and give us the ticket number and so forth. Not accommodating customer reviews. What you think customers aren't reviewing you just because they're not on your site? Of course they're reviewing you. Never recommending a competitor. You know, customers know that you aren't superhuman. They know that your product is good in most circumstances, but not in every circumstance. There are some circumstances, almost certainly, where it would be in your customer's interest to buy from someone else. If you know that, it's unethical, in my view, to keep trying to sell to that customer. You should advise the customer. They'd be better off doing this with company XYZ. I don't think it should be any wonder that customers no longer trust the marketers they have to deal with. Okay? A Forrester survey showed that 70% of consumers trust the recommendations of their friends. About half of consumers trust the, the opinions of complete strangers whose reviews they read online. Only about 10% of consumers actually trust advertising to tell them the truth. You know why? Because it doesn't tell them the truth. That's why. Advertising is advertising. That's why. It's paid media. Cheers, Star. Anybody, you, have you seen the TV show Cheers? Do you, have you seen reruns of that in India? Do you see that once in a while? Norm Peterson was that bar fly, the, the, you know, the bar fly. He said so he had a great line once. He said, once the trust goes out of a relationship, it's really no fun lying to them anymore. <laughs> That's the situation marketers are in today. At the end of the 20th century, They've gone through you know, uh, pro several decades of basically dissembling with their customers and telling them that their product is better than you know, it was, and now customers don't believe them anymore. And it's not fun to lie anymore. I think to be trustable, you have to apply the principle of reciprocity to customers. I talked about the principle of reciprocity this morning. It's found in every major religion. It's the golden rule in the Christian religion. It's treating the customer the way you'd like to be treated if you were the customer. That's the principle of reciprocity. Let me show you how some companies do that. Amazon. I love Amazon. I've never taken a, a, a bit of money from Amazon. I've never done a day of work for them. But for my money, Amazon is the world's most customer-centric company. You would do a lot best and better. Uh, you would do a lot worse in your business if you just simply did this. Think what Amazon would do and do that. That would be a really, really good policy. So I buy a lot of books. I try to keep up on things because I'm a business author myself. So I want to make sure I know I'm on top of what the topics are out there. Um, and it's very simple to order a book from Amazon. I'm reading an article online. I see this you know, book, and I go over right to Amazon. I click on, click on the book, and it comes to my house. It already got my credit card number and my address. Easy peasy. Except one time, I saw this book by a couple of uh, 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 professors, uh, and I thought, boy, I ought to get that book. And I went to the Amazon site, I ordered that book, and I get, warning, you already bought this book from Amazon, are you sure you want another copy? No, I don't want another copy, thank you very much. I forgot I bought it already. What is Amazon doing here? Remember I said, one of the things that's untrustable is profiting from a customer's lack of knowledge. Nine out of ten marketers would go ahead and sell me that book even though it's in their records that I bought it from them already. Nine out of ten people would do that because it's a profit after all and it's not their mistake, it's my mistake. They're just making money off me. 
But Amazon doesn't do that. Amazon uses their database, which is a heck of a lot smarter than my database, to help save me money, help me have a better life, help me run a better business. Okay? They're acting in my interest. And from my standpoint, it's now that much more frictionless to buy a book from Amazon. Because not only don't I have to give them my credit card number and my address, I don't even have to check to see if I have the book. You know, if, they, if I have the book, they'll tell me. I sometimes order a book from Amazon to see if I have it. <laughs> I have. I've done that. I thought I bought the book. Let me order it again. Yeah, I do. I, saw, I got it somewhere. Ally Bank in the United States, formerly the General Motors Acceptance Corporation, they were spun off as an on, they're basically an online bank. But Ally is doing it very differently. <clears throat> Every page on Ally's uh, website has a toll-free number that you can call if you're, if you're stuck and an estimated wait time to answer, okay? Every page. Every product page has a button you can click to submit your review of that product if you're a product owner, you know, if you've used the product, okay? JetBlue, you know how they give refunds? Automatically. I was on a JetBlue flight a couple years ago. It was very late. As we landed at Kennedy Airport, it was five hours late. And, and we, everybody got a memo from the gate agent. We all got this memo. And the memo said, sorry about the delay. It was due to a mechanical problem. We take full responsibility for mechanical problems. And under our customer policy, you're due a full refund. The amount of the refund you're going to get depends on how much you paid for your ticket and how you paid, if you paid with cash or with true blue points. But don't worry, we know who you are, we know how you paid, we're going to automatically credit the refund to your account. When's the last time you got a refund from an airline like that? Right? Most airlines, when you ask for a refund, they say, yeah, send us the ticket number, send us the confirmation number, put a chicken in a bag, wave it over your head six times, and then we might give you a refund. They put friction in the refund process. And business-to-business -business customers also need to, need to feel that they have a trustable relationship with you. Microsoft sells SQL servers. SQL Server is for enterprise customers. Um, typically, the SQL Server, when you buy it, it comes with uh, some vouchers for your IT people to go to training classes. The training classes are run by the value-added resellers in the Microsoft network. So I buy a SQL Server. I give a voucher to my IT guy. He goes to get his training. He turns the voucher in there, the, via, the VAR gets paid by Microsoft. Microsoft came to me, they said, we got a problem. We're selling SQL servers in Southeast Asia, but only about 30% of the vouchers are being redeemed. 70% are going unclaimed. Now, the marketing people are excited about that because that 70% of the training cost goes back into the marketing budget. But the guy who talked to me, the EVP, wanted to know whether I thought that was a good idea. I said, no, I don't think that's a good idea. I think fundamentally, customers aren't getting all the value they could out of your product. And you're missing a great opportunity to convince them that you're really trustable, that you have their interest. So now what Microsoft does is, when you buy a SQL Server, if you don't use your training vouchers after about 30 days, you receive an email from Microsoft. Don't forget, we gave you these training vouchers. If you still have them, you should use them. Your IT people would be better on the SQL. Or if you don't have them, we'll replace them. These are examples of applying the principle of reciprocity to the customer relation. So, <clears throat> back to my definition of trustability. Trustability is not just trustworthiness. It's proactive trustworthiness. When you proactively protect the customer from injury, when you proactively act in the customer's interest, when it even costs you money to do so, that's trustable. That's trustability. You want to prove to your customer that you can be trusted, that you're really trustable, that you're proactively watching out for their interests? Let me give you some examples of proof points. Here's what, uh, warranty and benefit reminders. It's 11 months since you bought the product. Your warranty's up in 12 months. Is everything working OK? Um, objective comparison tools. Here's how this product compares to these three competitive products on this feature, this feature, this feature but objectively scored somewhere, probably by some third party. <coughs> Excuse me. Hosting customer reviews, like Ally Bank does. Put your review right here. Other customers can see it. You can still moderate the reviews. You know? By the way, did you know that 
the statistics show that a negative customer review correlates higher with a sale than a positive review? Seriously. Now, if, all, if you have all negative reviews, you're not going to get sales. But if you have 10 glowing reviews and then one real red-ass negative review, some guy who really got steamed at you, it gives credibility to the positive reviews. It means your reviews are honest. How about overpayment notices? You overpaid here, we're going to give you a credit back. Or recommending competitors, I mentioned that before. Or proactive refunds like, oh, that's what Amazon is doing now. Jeff Bezos announced it in his letter to the shareholder a couple of years ago. He said, you know, when a customer calls in to the contact center, that's the, that's the sign that something went wrong. The, but, but here's what happens. The contact center agent, they look on their computer, and the computer knows. Yeah, their video didn't stream well. Okay, And if the computer says that, agrees with the customer, they issue a refund. So Bezos says, why does the customer even have to call in? If we know he's due a refund, let's give him the refund. And that's what they do now. If you order a video from Amazon and it doesn't stream well, or you uh, order a product that doesn't get delivered on time, they know it. The computer knows. And they issue a, a refund automatically. You could do a lot worse than practicing some of these ideas in order to convince your customers that you can be trusted. You can be trusted. <clears throat> How many of you enjoy scary movies? Raise your hand high. Raise your hand high. How many of you don't? OK. Um, the reason I ask this question is this is the number one most predictive question of relationship longevity in OkCupid's database. They have hundreds of questions, and this particular question has, if you only have to rely on one single question, this is the most reliable one to project how long a couple will, be get, will remain together, whether they both like scary movies or they both don't like scary movies. Now, why is that? No one knows why. It just is. And that's what you get from databases. It just is. You can't understand why. We can make up all sorts of reasons why, but when you're trying to make up a reason, what are you doing? You're searching for the story behind this. What's the logic in it? That's what you're searching for, the story. Stories are how human brains are organized. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They have pathos and drama and satisfaction, OK? Stories have a logical flow. It's a cause and an effect, and a cause and an effect, and an effect, and a cause and an effect. That's what stories are. Telling a story is much more persuasive than statistics. A psychology professor did an experiment. He called um, um, some professional statisticians to uh, answer a question. Uh, and he wanted to get, them to guess how likely each of these seven different statements was for this person, Linda. They heard a story about Linda, a very politically active woman. And at the end of the story, the, the statisticians were asked to score from highest to lowest the most likely descriptions of this woman. Linda is a bank teller. or Linda is a psychiatric social worker, or she's a teacher in an elementary school, or a member of the League of Women Voters, or working in a bookstore and takes yoga classes, or a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. So these six points, and here's how, oh, and seven, Linda is active in the feminist movement. <coughs> these six point, seven points were scored, and here's how the statistician scored them, from most likely to least likely. <coughs> Take a look at that. Anybody notice a problem with that? Now remember, these are professional statisticians. They know whereof they speak. But they were told this story, and they were asked to rate. Well, according to how they rated, they rated at least likely that Linda's a bank teller. 
they rated it more likely that Linda's a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. What's wrong with that? It's self-contradictory, isn't it? By definition, it has to be less likely that she's active in the feminist movement and a bank teller than it is that she is just a bank teller. By definition. And these were professional statisticians. Now, why did they rank the likelihoods this way? Because being a bank teller and active in the feminist movement, well, that's something I can see. I can see that as a story. Yeah, I get that. Okay? Being a bank teller, that's a status. That's a, you know, I don't, you know, it's not a sudden tell story. See what I'm saying? Telling stories is key. You can never underestimate the power of a great story. Ed Henrick, who's group VP at Oracle and a former chief customer officer at Responses, which was bought by Oracle, said that when he was at Responses just running the sales organization, we encouraged our sales reps to tell stories of customer successes. And we ranked their stories by persuasiveness. They counted for 25% of a rep's incentive bonus. It's amazing. Just telling stories. Sound? Oh, wait a minute. We haven't hooked up sound. Here it is. My problem. I should have done it. Okay, we'll try it again. I'm going to have sound, okay? Ça, chérie Ben oui, c'est fou. Never underestimate the power of a great story, courtesy of Canal. Okay. Stories are simply more persuasive than facts. Okay? So, one of the things you want to do is you want to paint a picture of the customer journey to eliminate friction and organize your thinking. That's what customer journeys are about. Telling stories that will explain the facts that you can observe, all right, the data that you have. Customer journeys, um, uh, uh, the value of journey mapping includes uh, understanding each customer's personas, uh, discovering touch points and process flows, and, and uh, relating, uh, relating the emotions that are involved in these inter interactions, okay? There's six phases, right, basically corresponding to the purchase funnel and usage funnel. Um, and you create personas. Maybe soccer moms is one of your personas. You look at their customer journey. You try to optimize the customer experience. How many of you here have done customer journey mapping at your company? Okay. Okay, so eight or ten. Um, it's, a, it's a very good technique for taking the data, the do you like scary movies data, and turning it into explanatory stories. Journey mapping. I think you can use journey mapping for three different things. You could simply understand a day in the life, okay, based on particular personas. What is the day of a life of a soccer mom or a, a, a divorced widow, whatever. Um, customer of the future, given the trends and changes identified, how will your customers think about and use the product or service in the future, as also, also early adopters customer journeys. That's very good because if you're a growing company, the early adopters, their journeys are going to give you clues on how to market to the followers. 
<clears throat> in journey mapping and the personas, you need to get feedback from the customers about what they're thinking or what their needs are. And every kind of customer feedback has value to a company. Here is a letter, a written, handwritten letter, handed by an eight-year-old girl to a uh, um, flight attendant on Qantas. Hello, my name is Nicola. I'm eight years old. This is my first flight, but I'm not scared. I like to watch the clouds go by. My mom says the crew is nice. I think your plane is good. Thanks for a nice flight. Don't bleep up the landing. Love, Nicola. Now, why is that funny? Because that bleep word is so out of, out of context, right? Here's a lovely little eight-year-old girl with a cute picture and a happy letter, and she drops the F-bomb right in the bottom, right? It's out of context. Human beings are creatures of context. Context allows everyone to read lengthy strings of scrambled words perfectly well. And context is how we interpret our interactions with others. It gives strength to relationships. Um, stories provide context. All right? We use stories to put things into context and to remember them. And the plot line, the context within a story, helps us solve problems. It helps us understand why scary movies matter. Okay? Context allows us to do that. We can also use context to create learning relationships with our customers. Customer tells you what he wants or how he wants it. Save me time. That's what's important to me. You customize your product, you tailor your service, or some elements associated with it to address that need that the customer expressed. And now, you've co-created the customer experience. The more effort the customer invests in teaching you how to serve him better, the greater his stake will be in making the relationship work. Because even if a competitor has the same level of customization that you have, he's first got to reteach the competitor what he's already taught you. See the benefit? That's what I would call a learning relationship. So what's necessary to set up a learning relationship? Well, you look for some aspect of the customer experience that's individually tailored by the customer. Some aspect that you can specify, this, is the way, this, this customer wants to be treated this particular way. OK? And then you interact, engage with the customer to co-create this experience. So let me give you some examples. A florist business. You run a flower shop. How could you create a learning relationship with your retail customers? Any ideas? <clears throat> the mood that they're in? Maybe, but not the easiest way. Say it. The kind of flowers that their family members like or that they order, yeah. So you ordered tulips last time. Would you like another spray of tulips? That's a great idea. Any, what else? Yes, the occasions. Uh, don't forget, your wife's birthday is coming up in a month. Last year, you gave her irises, and this was the inscription. That's how a flower shop would create a learning relationship. How about a dry cleaner in laundry? Come on. It's easy. A dry cleaner in laundry creates a learning relationship. How do they do that? Time? Oh, maybe time, you're timing the different pieces, maybe, yeah, okay, timing. Yes and no, that's, I don't think that's so obvious, but uh, there, there are, I like my shirts with starch. Gopal likes his shirts without starch. I like mine folded. He likes his on a hanger. I like my stuff delivered. He takes his, he picks it up on our way home from work. Just knowing that stuff about individual customers can create that learning relationship. I had a, an audience in Belgium, and a woman came up afterwards. We had this uh, little exercise, and she said, you know what my dry cleaner did? She said, I, I, I found this new dry cleaner. I get, brought all my clothes in, and they sent back a note. They said, the next time you buy a new suit or a new dress, send us the spare material and the buttons that come with it, and we'll put them in a drawer with your name on it, and if we have to repair them, we'll be able to repair them. Now, think about this for a second. I run a dry cleaner, and Gopal runs a dry cleaner. We're next door to each other. I cut my price, he cuts his price. I offer better service, he offers better service. I open hours longer, he opens hours longer. But if I create a learning relationship with a customer, it doesn't matter that he offers to create it. I've got your buttons and material. To deal with him, you've got to get them back. 
right? You've already taught me how to serve you. That's a learning relationship. How about a toxic waste hauling service? And by the way, the more complex the business is, the easier it is to create a learning relationship because the more diverse customer needs are. Well, a toxic waste hauling service could create learning relationship. Think about toxic waste hauling. Um, <clears throat> one thing is that every manufacturer has different kinds of waste. Okay, so preparing for particular kinds of waste will make it easier. Uh, sometimes government reports have to be filed. Well, why don't you tell me the data that you, you need to put on a report, and I'll file a report for you. These are all learning relationship ideas. Okay, now we come to the uh, checklist, learning relationship checklist. What do different customers do differently with your product? I'm going to put this checklist up again in just a second. Um, can you save your customer time or effort by remembering some detail or specification? What additional tasks does your customer have to accomplish that you might do? Um, what ancillary products or services? Uh, and are there any particular types of customers with complex problems or management issues? That's what we're going to do on our exercise. <clears throat> Here's the exercise. You can read the exercise. At your tables, I want you to briefly introduce everybody at the table. Focus on one or two businesses <coughs> at the table. And let's brainstorm how that business could, in fact, create learning relationships with its individual customers, OK? We got 15 minutes. It's uh, 5 to 6. At 6.10, I'll ask for presentations. I want you to present to the crowd. And I, on my next slide, I've got this is the exercise. It's just smaller print. And this is the checklist I gave you for learning relationships, OK? I'll leave this slide up while you do the exercise, while I go out for a smoke. All right? 15 minutes. OK, take two more minutes. Decide whether you have some ideas that you'd like to present to the room. Take two more minutes, and then we'll ask for volunteers. OK? <clears throat> OK, um, we have microphones stationed here. Right? We got somebody running microphones. Who wants to volunteer with some ideas for the company that they were working with? Anybody? You get extra credit for volunteering first. Who's raising their hand? Here. Yes, sir. Yeah, wait for the microphone. There and there. Um, you want to go? Introduce yourself and the company you're dealing with and son, give us some. Stand up, please, so everybody can see you. Thank you very much. OK. Hello. I'm Ashish Podar. I am a product head at Loyalty Rewards. So I'll be just discussing a couple of use cases for a retail loyalty program. So what we run uh, retail You have 90 seconds. Yeah, sure. We run retail loyalty programs for different business verticals. So what we have the ability to do is we can have transactional-based incentives, which is like either giving cashbacks or pointbacks, or you could have non-transactional incentives. For example, a food or a restaurant business can offer you know, one biryani free on five biryani orders. So that's one kind of customization. But taking that to the next level at an individual preference level, while running those retail loyalty programs, we can record customer preferences in the terms that vegetarian, non-vegetarian orders, or some people like vegetarian orders on some typical days. So that's an example of how a product can be customized to the to the business user's needs as well as to the end customer needs. The other example would be how we could solve some more problems for our, let's say, customers, uh, for our business partners. We, we actually do competitive analysis for them. So we can tell them which regions to expand into and uh, help them grow their businesses. So that would be some of the services that we could think of in the short span of time. Very nice. Thank you very much.
Just hand it back to him. And we have a mic over here. Uh, tell us about the business and some of the ideas you had. Uh, my name is Prashant. I am Stand from up, Ex please. Yeah. Yeah. Face the crowd. Uh, my name is Prashant. I am from Accentive. We Hold the mic up to your... We are a loyalty solution provider company. We worked on a credit card, a credit card company. And we, uh, uh, for enhancing the experience, we uh, discussed about providing co-branded card for the, um, each category of the spenders. Like, I mean, uh, some spenders uh, are from departmental store or groceries. Some are uh, travelers. Some are value seekers, so providing co-branded cards for each of them in each of the categories basis their expense and providing them a specific offers to that particular uh, category pertaining to their uh, uh, the uh, kind of budgets that they spend. Second, uh, simplifying the customer journey. That is through uh, uh, simplifying the customer journey at the same time saving some cost for the uh, service provider. By by providing, I mean, uh, uh, gauging the uh, s solutions that are sought by the customer and uh, providing them self-service desk and automating the whole process. And then finally, providing them um, through collaboration some added services like uh, travel insurance for the travelers and uh, card protection insurance for uh, the safety of the cards. All right. So. Thank you. <laughs> Next. Okay, up uh, one here and one there. All right. Three of uh, I mean, we are from three companies: Future Group, Hindustan Petroleum, and uh, Jet Privilege. Uh, but the product that we have chosen is different from all the three. So uh, we have decided about a case uh, study of a, a truck driver. So different companies are doing different things for customer experience of the drivers. So, for example, Mahindra and Mahindra, they're doing uh, modifications in their truck design. They're including a berth in the truck so that the driver can sleep peacefully when he is taking rest. And they've included a cabinet so that the driver can keep his food safely and it doesn't mix with, uh, doesn't get with, mixed with dust and also he has hygienic, safe food and he gets proper uh, sleep. So that is a relationship with the driver and then they're sending their employees as a customer engagement program with the drivers. Uh, traveling with the drivers and uh, in case of breakdowns, they're solving it there and then and they're making designs, uh, modifications in the engine as per the recommendations of the driver. So in a country like India, that is a big thing to, you know, uh, deal with the, the drivers and in their language, understanding their concerns and then coming up with the design specifications. And in HPCL, we are also providing uh, driver insurance to, as they mentioned about insurance. So some uh, safety messages are being sent by auto sector companies uh, to these truck drivers. We are also uh, making um, in, uh, use of those safety programs. And in case of accidents, deaths, those uh, loyalty customers or the uh, our fleet owners, the drivers are getting insurance. The family is getting that insurance. Good. Account. Thank you very much. OK. Time for one more. Go ahead. Uh, just talk into it. It'll work. Talk into it. They have to turn it on. Yeah. Hello. Am I? Yeah. There you are. Good evening, everyone. This is Trupti Vanare, and I represent an automobile company which is called as Tata Motors. And this, uh, like she spoke about commercial vehicle, I will be talking about passenger vehicle, how we have customized in passenger vehicle segment. Now, this case study is about Tata Aria. Tata Aria is a full-size SUV and uh, based on our customer, uh, whatever feedback we got, uh, they, it had some problem with the sitting or with the AC. And we crunched it down to a compact SUV which was Tata Nexon. Uh, and uh, now I'll talk about three uh, customer profile that first would be if, if, if in your family you have an aged woman, so for her to climb an SUV, it will be difficult. But uh, by an ad added accessory of steps, it will be easier for her to fit in the car. So that is one kind of customization which we had. If you have a baby in the family, you can uh, have a baby special baby chair for the, fa for the kid. So it is easier for the family also to take care of the kid. So two examples. All right. Thank you very much. Welcome. You guys all did a great job. Very good. We don't have time for every table to present, so um, I hope everybody 
got something out of the exercise. I want to finish the presentation. We have 15 more minutes to go. That's all it'll take. I want to go through a few more slides. If you want to be customer-centric, it's not easy. It's uh, difficult. And there are three basic types of problems. One is, do you have the right capabilities to remember individual customers and interact with them? Um, another one is, uh, uh, are you aligned correctly? If you want to get customers to stay longer, do you pay your salespeople for the length of the relationship or just for acquiring a new customer, for example? And do your people have the right mindset? Okay? Do they want to make it work for customers? Let's talk about capabilities. A friend of mine went to Home Depot one day, and uh, she was uh, very disappointed. She was looking for a particular item in the Home Depot store. She talked to a salesperson there. He ran her around the board. She couldn't find it. Talked to another salesperson. They didn't know it. And then she couldn't find anybody else. She was very mad. She came home that night, <clears throat> and she got a survey. Uh, Home Depot called her. What was your experience like at the store today? And she went off on him, said it was a terrible experience, terrible, it was awful, this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened. They never called her back after that. No one from Home Depot ever called her. She said what her words were, oh, wait a minute. Her words were, they don't care for their customers, so I can't trust them anymore. Now, the truth is, Home Depot very much does care for its customers, but they're their systems and processes aren't aligned. I'll tell you exactly what happened in that situation. I can tell it. It was just a coincidence that she got a call for a Home Depot survey on the day that she frequented the store. The people making the survey had no idea that she'd been in the store. They didn't get any feedback from the store. And the fact that she was really angry about that store visit is something they put in their data reports, but they never got that back to the company. Okay? They wanted, Home Depot wants to do better. They just don't because they're not aligned. Another friend of mine told me a very similar story about his experience with FedEx Ground. He's a very regular FedEx customer. He uses mostly Express. FedEx Express goes overnight delivery. There's also FedEx Ground service for near in and so forth. He's a very big FedEx Express customer, and he called FedEx Ground, same company, same brand, and he said it was a nightmare in terms of dealing with because their um, systems didn't communicate with FedEx Express, they said one time, they didn't pick them up at time. Um, it was going to take uh, a lot more money than that was on the website. And his words were, I'll never use FedEx again. I don't have to. If I don't have to, I don't trust them. And again, the same is true. FedEx also wants to be customer-centric, but they're not aligned. Their systems are not aligned. Now, I want to go back to this trustability issue, good intentions and competence. Good intentions and competence are actually related. It sounds like good intentions is one thing, competence is a totally different thing. But if, if you don't care enough to invest in the capabilities required to treat customers properly, how good can your intentions really be, right? If we don't take responsibility for our own competence, if it's not important to us, then maybe our intentions aren't that good. Companies are doing a really lousy job of improving their technical capabilities. 49% uh, of contact centers don't have fully automated, uh, fully integrated new digital channels. Managing multi-channel interactions at most contact centers is uh, 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 a process that involves three open applications at a time. Uh, <clears throat> roughly 90% of the, of the reason why people call in is because the online system couldn't fix it, and yet less than 50%. <coughs> Only about 50% of contact centers can actually integrate the phone conversation with the web. When you call a contact center because um, you couldn't get it done online, what's the first thing they ask you? You know, what's your problem? They have no clue that you had this uh, online session, that you were calling in because of that. You have to explain it all over again, what you were doing. Why you just spent 30 minutes on their website and they don't know. Well, there are four ways to connect the web session to the phone call if you run a contact center. One is, on, a web, on an app, a click to call button. If your company sells an app, if the company makes an app available to customers, on the app itself, there ought to be a button that I can push to talk to somebody or chat with somebody. That way, the interaction records from my smartphone, okay, or from my computer app, 
go directly with that button, right? And the cult contact center rep or the chat agent will know what I was wrestling with. <clears throat> or proactive chat. I've been at the same place on the website three different times, uh, and, and, and you know what? A chat window pops up. Are you having problems? That's integrated experience. Or a call me button. That's what Amazon does. If you have a problem uh, and you try to contact them, the question they ask you is, would you like us to call you? Give us your phone number and tell us a time, or we'll tell you how long we can do it. it takes, you know, wait time is no more than five minutes. So I give them my phone number and they call me. And the fact that I've given them my phone number means they connect my click stream from that session and they know what I was doing. I don't have to explain it again. Or temporal phone numbers. A temporal phone number is a temporary phone number. So I'm on your website. I can't get handled. I, I look up the, call for the toll free number. I see the number. But that number is unique to my website, to my session. It's unique to me. I'm the only one that has that particular phone number. We recycle those phone numbers every you know, day. You might have thousands of them to give out. But when that phone rings with that, from that number, they know it's connected to my web session. These are existing technologies that companies don't use today. And they don't use it because their intentions aren't really that good. Okay, They don't have the capabilities because their intentions aren't really that good. And then there's the issue of alignment, alignment issues. There was a dentist in Australia who had a thriving practice. He had like several practices. He, had a pra he also had a consulting business. He had millions of dollars in, the banks from his, in, the, in a bank from his various accounts. But his personal account got low once, and he bounced a check. It was very embarrassing. He had millions of dollars with this bank that just went in this, this particular account. And they bounced a check. Well, he quit that bank. He quit that bank. And now they don't have that millions of dollars anymore. A telecom company. They said, our customer experience is very important to us. We're grading our executives on NPS scores and so forth. So <clears throat> problem was, one quarter, they weren't going to make their numbers. So the chief financial officer unilaterally decided no customer refunds will be issued until after the first of the next quarter. No more refunds. Guess what happened to NPS scores? Exactly. Here's my favorite story. I talked to a friend of mine who worked at a contact center for a music retailer in the United States. There were about 50 people in this contact center because the contact center was a sales organization. They didn't service the music. They sold guitars, keyboards, drum sets, things like that. And they were paid on commission. Okay? They got a small hourly wage, but they really made their most of the money on commission from the sales. My friend said that the vast majority of inbound sales were coming from people who had tried to buy online and were unable to because the site doesn't work. But they're not going to tell the company because then they wouldn't get their commissions. Those are all alignment problems. And then the third class of problems, mindset. You can't write a line of code or a business process rule that results in employees delighting a customer. The employee has to want to delight the customer. So do your employees want to do it? I'll tell you a story about two airlines. My wife and I were going on a weekend holiday in France to rendezvous with, we lived in London, and we were uh, going on a weekend holiday in France to rendezvous with some of our friends from America. We were all rendezvousing in this little town on the Brittany coast. So she called British Airways up, and she said that she, she needed the flights down. She got that flight. Then she had to call a friend in the United States and ask when everybody was leaving. When would they leave? And then she coordinated the return flight with everybody else's schedule. So she called British Airways back, and that's when she discovered, you know, she didn't call them. She used the website. That's when she discovered that had she bought a round-trip ticket, it would have been less than the price of either of the one-way tickets that she was buying. So it was only like 20 minutes into the transaction. She called the contact center. The contact center agent said, I'm sorry, ma'am. Well, I can't fix that. Nope, the system won't allow it. Oh, you should have known. You, should have, you shouldn't have bought. I'm sorry. It's, it's non-refundable. It's right there. I'm really sorry. I, I know. I know. She was apologetic. 
She couldn't do anything. The very next weekend, we went off on a holiday uh, weekend with our kids to uh, Amsterdam. And we bought tickets on EasyJet. EasyJet is a low fare carrier in Europe. All the tickets are non-refundable. Um, but it's a bank holiday, so that means that Monday was off too. And the weekend traffic was really heavy. We didn't get to the airport in time for the flight. And I'm thinking, oh, brother, another weekend shot really bad. You know, these tickets are unrefundable. But when we got to the counter, the, gate, the, the ticket agent said, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. The traffic is really bad. Listen, I'll tell you what. You know, um, why, don't, why don't you guys stay at Gatwick Airport tonight at one of the hotels, <clears throat> and I will waive the rebooking fee, and I'll book you on our first flight out tomorrow morning to Amsterdam. It's at 630. Uh, and by the way, give me the name of your hotel in Amsterdam, and I'll call them and tell them what happened, and you, they, won't, they probably won't charge you tonight. Think of the difference between these two airlines. Now, the mindset at EasyJet was, what's in the customer's interest? What can we do to help the customer and, and, and help the customer enjoy their experience? The mindset at British Airways is such that they don't want their employees to have that freedom. They don't want their employees to be able to take that initiative. The system won't let them. The rule is the rule, OK? So Peter Drucker said, Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture is far more important to a company's success than its business strategy. I want to think about the customer experience on two dimensions. How easy is it to automate the experience with a machine? And how engaged is the customer likely to be in the, this particular experience? So in the lower right-hand quadrant, we have business as usual. They're easily automated. They said it's routine. The customer, and the customer isn't really that involved in it. It's just a routine day-to-day -day stuff. On the left-hand side, you have um, uh, threats to cost efficiency. Here, it's a routine. It, it may be a small incremental experience, but you have some kind of paperwork or some kind of manual labor that goes into it. So that's a chance to reduce your uh, uh, cost if you can automate those. In the upper right-hand quadrant, this is where you have automated customer lifecycle events. So for instance, the example I gave you earlier, the very first day a new mobile company customer gets their bill, they're probably going to call in. Well, that's a predictable life cycle event. You can anticipate that because majority of customers call in when they get their first bill. So you can automate some of it. You can have a script for handling it. You can figure out how to do that. It's in the upper left-hand quadrant that you have surprises and trials, difficulties that you didn't anticipate. You couldn't predict until you haven't automated anything. Here, you need employees, line employees, customer-facing employees, making what I would call non-routine decisions. Here, the contact center agent is being tasked to, to do something that isn't in a script, OK? Maybe it's an exception to the rule, whatever. It, however you handle it, what you need, you need employees who are engaged in their work and enabled to accomplish their jobs. Engaged and enabled employees, we've used that quality before. Engaged employee is somebody who has good intentions. They're enabled because they have the competence to carry out those intentions, you see? And if you have engaged and enabled employees, you could have a really good company. Uh, and they could take initiative on their own. You know, <clears throat> reminds me of a story. I want to tell you a quick story with a punchline. In the uh, 1700s, an Austrian civil servant built a mechanical man and put him in an oriental costume and put him behind a chess table. And he was rumored to be able to play chess. They called him the Mechanical Turk. Uh, and you would sit down in front of that Mechanical Turk, and you would move a piece, and a Mechanical Turk's arm would come out, and he'd move a piece. Then you'd move a piece, and he would move a piece. So the civil servant took the Mechanical Turk around Europe, and he amazed kings and queens and princes. Until one day in Paris, the mechanical Turk played a chess master. And he beat the chess master at chess. Whereupon, perhaps because he was French, the chess master was so insulted at having be been beaten by a machine that he went up to the mechanical Turk and he yanked the cabinetry apart. And sure enough, underneath the table, there's a little man with levers and magnets moving the pieces around. And the master said, hey, there's a person in there. That's the secret to a great customer experience. There has to be a person in there somewhere, OK? 
And if your people are engaged in their jobs and enabled to accomplish their mission, they can self-organize. Self-organization. Self-organization is a biological concept. Bees self-organize. No single bee knows how to build a beehive. No single person in the world knows how to make a mechanical pencil. Somehow they appear because we're self-organized. I'll give you an example. You want your employees to self-organize. A customer problem comes in and they solve it themselves without top-down direction. I will give you an example of self-organization. I want you to start clapping, but I want you to clap in unison. I won't say anything more. You just go ahead. Go ahead. Start clapping, please. Come on, in unison. OK, OK. So that took about five seconds, which is four and a half seconds more than most crowds take, by the way. Uh, but you all clapped in unison. And there was nobody in the head of the room going, clap, 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 was there? I wasn't telling you how to do it. You did it yourselves. You clap, you're listening to others, they clap. There were several patterns going on. The one pattern got more and it dominated. That's self-organization. That's what you want your employees to do. Let me give you an example of how Commonwealth Bank does it. When a contact center agent has a problem for which there's no scripted solution, if the contact center agent thinks that she knows or he knows a right solution for that customer problem, the only permission they need to offer that to the customer is to get one other contact center agent to sign off on that as a good idea. Two of them sign off on it. It goes in the record. They offer it to the customer. How about this? How do we do this? Victoria Short, the CMO at CBA, she told me that they had that program running for about five months when I interviewed her. She said they had about 80 different times during that five-month period when there was a two-person decision. They hadn't had to reverse a single one. They look at each one of them. And the contact center agents are jazzed. Now they're in charge. They're doing stuff. They're satisfying the customer. One final story. I want to tell you a story a hotel you told me. And it's about the power of self-organization. When your people want to treat the customer right, they can overcome lack of capabilities, misalignment. OK? Culture trumps strategy. Culture will eat strategy for breakfast. Roger Dow, the president for marketing at Marriott, in the year 2001 or 2002, he had a meeting with his IT people. He said, look, we have 435 Marriott properties in the United States. And yet, when I stay at a single Marriott, they don't even know I've been there before. They don't know if I've been there. I want a database that will tell the check-in agent that I've been there before so they can say, welcome back. And the IT people went away and they thought about it for weeks. They came back and said, so, yes, sir, Mr. Dow, we can do this, but the database is going to take about a half a million dollars, uh, and it'll take uh, eight months, but we'll do it. And he just went ballistic. He said, half a million dollars? That's ridiculous. We, we got the data. Look, look, you come up with another way. Roger said that that very evening, he went off on a uh, business trip to Moline, Illinois. It's outside of Chicago. And he went to Moline specifically to stay at this particular Marriott that had just redone their lobby. And it was part of the new lobby treatment. It was going to go all over the country. He'd been at that Marriott about five years previously, but this time it was his new. He went to see the lobby. And as he walked up to the check-in desk, the clerk looked him in the face and said, welcome back, sir. He said, excuse me. I said, welcome back. Sir, you've stayed with us before, haven't you? He said, yes, I have, young lady, but do you know who I am? I'm the president for marketing in this corporation. My IT people say it takes a half a million dollars for you to tell me what you just told me. How'd you do it? She said, well, sir, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to offend you, but remember when you pulled your rental car up the front door and the bellman took your luggage? And he said, have you stayed here before? And you must have said yes. Because he put the luggage down and he looked at me and he went like that. And that's our signal that you stayed here before. So I say welcome back. Thank you very much for a great conference. Thank you. Oh, <clears throat> wait a minute, wait a minute. I almost forgot. Gopal, stand up, please. Gopal Garg, come up here. Um, Gopal Garg is my representative in uh, India. Uh, and I know that some of you have uh, already reached out to him. Um, you know, we do workshops, 
uh, on, for companies, I, but I, I, you know, we charge money, we have a business, but if you think I could be of benefit, and, I, and, and I'll probably not have a horse of voice next time, if you think I could help you, um, reach out to Gopal, and uh, tell him your email address. Oh, Gopal.garg at truebizsoul.com. Yeah, T-R-U-B-I-Z-S-O-L dot com. Gopal dot garg, right? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, guys. The end of the show. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you guys thoroughly enjoyed this session. Can we have some more applause? Let Don know how much you enjoyed this session. Whoa, that's some energy. Uh, let's take a small break. We'll get back and then pep up with some more energy. We want you guys back with a lot of energy because the evening has just begun and it's going to be a fantabulous night, I promise you guys. So save your energy, look your best, and we'll have a rocking evening. See you soon. <laughs>